Hi, I'm Mark Adiers, and I'm recording this video in connection with our Constitutional Law Matters event entitled Who's in Charge of the Westminster Parliament? When we talk about the Westminster Parliament, um, we're talking about the United Kingdom uh, Parliament. Uh, it has uh, two uh, main functions. It makes law and it holds the executive government to account. So Parliament is distinct from, although it is related to, uh, the executive government consisting of the Prime Minister, the Cabinet and so on. And the Westminster Parliament is also to be distinguished from the other legislatures which exist in the UK, in Scotland, in Wales and in Northern Ireland. Now when we ask this question about who is in charge of Parliament, uh, the theoretical answer really is that Parliament is in charge of itself. Uh, Parliament controls its own procedures, so it determines how it uh, does things. And as a matter of constitutional uh, law, uh, Parliament is sovereign. That means that legally its powers to legislate are unlimited. It can make or unmake any law and no one can question the laws that it makes, not the courts uh, and not legally at least anyone else. The reality is rather different. The executive or the government uh, dominates Parliament in many respects. It dominates it numerically because it will normally have a majority of MPs in the House of Commons. And it dominates Parliament procedurally because under Parliament's procedures uh, the government uh, can decide for the most part uh, what, is de what is debated, what business is transacted and according to what sort of uh, timetable. It's therefore usually uh, easy for a government with a big majority, as the current government uh, does, to get its own way, including uh, by getting its legislation enacted by Parliament. So in this video I want to focus on the issue of parliamentary sovereignty, this idea that um, Parliament's power to make the law is legally unlimited. When we link this with the practical reality that it's the government that exercises great influence and control over Parliament, it leaves us with a very stark conclusion, which is that the government itself, by exercising a high degree of control over Parliament, has its hands on very significant levers of power. It means that Parliament is it means that the government is very well placed to get Parliament to do at whatever the government at once. And of course, when Parliament legislates, Parliament can do whatever it wants. Now, it would be a simplification to say that that means that the government can do whatever it wants. But there is at least a grain of truth in that. It means that the government is very well placed to get the law made or changed in whatever way it wishes. So I'm going to try to do three things um, in this uh, talk by way of unpacking the idea of parliamentary sovereignty with particular reference to this question about who's in charge. Uh, firstly, can Parliament limit its own power? Secondly, has Parliament ever succeeded in limiting its own powers? And thirdly, are there any involuntary limits on what Parliament can do? In other words, are there things that Parliament can't do uh, even if it wants to do them? Are there things that are outside of Parliament's control? Well, let's start with the first of those questions. So, can Parliament limit its own power? Well, there's a bit of a paradox uh, here, because on the one hand, if we say that Parliament is all-powerful and can therefore do anything, then that would seem to imply that um, anything includes limiting its own power. If it can't limit its own power, then there's something it can't do. And yet if Parliament can limit its own power, and did limit its own power, it would no longer be all-powerful. It would no longer be, be sovereign. Now this is a sort of intractable problem in one sense, but in, in reality we have to really uh, decide, or we have to infer, uh, what kind of sovereignty Parliament has. And, and for this purpose we can distinguish between two uh, sort of understandings of how all of this might work. Firstly, there is the idea of self-embracing sovereignty. On this view, 
Parliament can impose limits on itself. So it's sovereign, but it can impose restrictions on itself that would stop it from being sovereign. In other words, it can, be, it can terminate its own sovereignty by legislating into effect limits that would then mean there were things it couldn't do. The alternative view is to say that Parliament has a continuing form of sovereignty, meaning that it can do anything except limit its own power, meaning that paradoxically the sovereign Parliament can do anything except for one thing, namely restricting its own authority. Well, which of these views is correct? Frustratingly, perhaps, the answer is that we don't really know. There are no absolutely clear answers to these questions. These questions are not ones that are regularly tested in court. It's quite rare for the courts to have to um, uh, really assess these kinds of issues. But there have been a few occasions where courts have looked at this uh, kind of question. In some cases, the courts have very firmly come to the view that Parliament cannot limit its own power. And that would seem to support this idea of continuing sovereignty, the idea that the one thing Parliament can't do is to restrict its own authority. But in other cases, there are some suggestions that Parliament may be able to impose formal restrictions on itself. What this means is that Parliament might be able to pass legislation which says, for instance, this legislation can't be amended or this legislation can't be repealed, in other words, got rid of, unless the Parliament that wants to do that complies with some special requirement, maybe using a particular form of words or securing a particular majority uh, for the legislation in question. Usually, legislation can be passed with a simple 50% majority, um, but maybe, for example, on this view, Parliament could specify that before a particular law could be repealed or amended, there would need to be a bigger majority, a two-thirds or three-quarters majority, for example. So there are these two views, that either Parliament can't impose any kinds of limits on itself, or that perhaps it can impose these sort of formal restrictions on itself that would then have to be complied with uh, before certain things could be done in the future. Um, like I say, there's no definitive answer to this in the case law. Uh, there is support in the case law for both of these uh, views, um, but it's something which has rarely been uh, tested. What I do want to look at is a couple of examples of situations where it's been argued that perhaps Parliament has succeeded in imposing restrictions on itself. And I want to ask whether or not they help us to understand this point any uh, better. The first example I want to look at is the Human Rights Act 1998. So the Human Rights Act gives uh, certain legal effects in UK law to the European Convention on Human Rights. The European Convention is an international treaty, that's an, an agreement between uh, different uh, countries or states, um, and the agreement is that if you sign the European Convention, uh, then you, as a state, will uh, respect uh, certain human rights standards. The Human Rights Act says that there are certain things that domestic courts can do to uphold those human rights, and in turn that means that individuals can go to domestic courts and they can enforce their human rights under the Human Rights Act. The Human Rights Act, uh, among other things, says that if a court finds that legislation, including an Act of Parliament, is incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights, the courts can issue what's called a Declaration of Incompatibility. So the court can say, this UK Act is inconsistent with the rights or with a right in the European Convention and we are going to issue a declaration to that effect. Now the Human Rights Act is very clear that when a declaration of incompatibility is issued it doesn't affect the law in question. It is still the law and there's no legal requirement in UK law for Parliament to change it. Parliament could, eat, could just say, well, OK, we hear what the court says. The court says that this is incompatible with the European Convention, but we don't care about that. We're just going to leave this law uh, in place. That would be perfectly uh, lawful. But in a recent case, the UK Supreme Court said 
that declarations of incompatibility do actually limit parliamentary sovereignty because they place so much pressure on Parliament to then change the law to bring it back into line with the European Convention. If that's true, then that would suggest that Parliament can do things that limit its own powers, things that limit its own uh, sovereignty. And that would provide us with an answer to the previous question about whether or not this is something that can actually be done. But even though this view has been supported recently by the Supreme Court, I'm not sure it's a convincing view. The better view is that any pressure that Parliament comes under when a court issues a declaration of incompatibility under the Human Rights Act is only political pressure. It doesn't mean it's not important, but it means that it's distinct from any legal limitation on Parliament's authority. Parliament can still ignore a declaration of incompatibility, and Parliament can still make a law that breaches the European Convention on Human Rights. It's just that if it wants to do those things, it's got to be willing to take any political fleck and put up with any political criticism that might come its way. But I think that to argue that this shows that Parliament has actually limited its sovereignty or limited its powers is a very difficult argument to sustain. My second example is European Union membership. Now, of course, the UK has now left the European Union. But when the UK was a member of the EU, European Union law had what we call primacy. And that means that European Union law takes priority over the law of individual member states to the extent that the two are incompatible. In the UK, courts could and did set aside Acts of Parliament if they were found to be incompatible with European Union law. Does that mean that Parliament wasn't sovereign while the UK was a member of the EU? Well, it's not quite as simple as that, because after all, the only reason that the courts were doing this is because Parliament had told them to. Parliament had enacted legislation, the European Communities Act 1972, which gave priority to European Union law over and above UK Acts of Parliament. So to say that Parliament uh, wasn't sovereign is difficult to uh, maintain, given that the court doing this kind of thing was consistent with Parliament's wishes. But it certainly might suggest that Parliament was able to manipulate the principle of sovereignty, which does normally require courts always to give effect to Acts of Parliament. And in that sense, we might think that it casts doubt on the very rigid view which says that Parliament cannot ever do anything that might detract from its own powers and from this principle that courts have always got to give effect to Acts of Parliament. Although all of that in one sense is in the past, it's still worth bearing in mind because actually, under the terms of Brexit, um, aspects of the withdrawal agreement, which now governs the relationship between the UK and the EU, also have primacy over UK law. And so actually, very similar legal issues still arise in relation to the withdrawal agreement. Finally, are there any limits on what Parliament can do that have nothing to do with what Parliament wants? In my EU example, uh, there were limits in the form of EU law, but the, the Parliament had authorised the courts to enforce those limits. So in that sense, it was still all consistent with Parliament's wishes. Are there any external limits on what Parliament can do, things it isn't allowed to do, even if it wants to do them? Now, in many legal systems, the answer would be yes, because a written constitution would say to the legislature, here's a list of things that you aren't allowed to do. Uh, you aren't allowed to take away basic rights. You aren't allowed to abolish the courts, um, etc., etc. But what about the UK, where we don't have a codified or written constitution? What if Parliament wanted to make an extreme law, for example, that offended a fundamental principle? What if, the court, what if Parliament wanted to abolish the court's powers of judicial review? In other words, the means by which courts can examine the legality of what the government does. If Parliament's really sovereign, it can presumably do that because it can do anything. But some judges have argued that it can't do things like this and that if it tried to, the courts would refuse to give effect to this sort of law.
So this suggests that actually, ultimately, Parliament isn't sovereign because there are certain things the courts wouldn't allow Parliament to do. But what would happen if we found ourselves in this kind of situation? We don't really know because this sort of issue doesn't really arise. The courts do their very best to avoid this kind of situation by interpreting legislation in a way that brings it into line with fundamental constitutional principles. So, for example, in cases where the Parliament does seem to have legislated to limit the court's role in judicial review, the, part, the courts have tended to say to Parliament, well, you, didn't, you surely didn't really mean to do that, um, so we're going to read the legislation in a way that avoids getting rid of judicial review. So we don't really know what would happen if a court ever said we simply won't give effect to this law because it's just too offensive to fundamental constitutional principles. What is likely, though, is that that would provoke a true constitutional crisis, the outcome of which it would be hard to predict. And the reality is that it's in the interest of neither Parliament nor the courts to provoke a constitutional crisis of that nature. And this uncertainty may be useful. After all, we don't have a written constitution that tells us what would happen in this kind of situation, so perhaps this kind of situation is best avoided in the first place. The uncertainty incentivises Parliament and the court not to go too far and encourages each to respect the other. So who is in charge of the Westminster Parliament? Well, in theory, it's in charge of itself and it has unlimited power to make the law. But in practice, the government exercises great influence over Parliament, influence that's all the more important because of parliamentary sovereignty. At the same time, the courts have an important role in interpreting the law. There's no constitution that limits Parliament's power, but the courts are able to exercise significant influence by interpreting the laws that Parliament makes in a way that usually will be consistent with constitutional principles. And in the background, there are these judicial warnings that I've talked about, about what might happen if Parliament pressed the logic of its sovereignty too far by attempting to enact extreme laws. The fact that we don't know what would happen if the court went through with those threats uh, may be uh, surprising, it might be frustrating that we don't know what would happen in that situation. But the fact that we don't know is an illustration of the fact that this kind of situation hasn't ever arisen. And that, arguably, is only a good thing.